a heads up before we get started. Mobbed Up contains explicit content, such as adult language and depictions of violence, including murder. Please be advised that this podcast might not be suitable for all audiences. If you've visited Chicago in the past couple decades, odds are you've probably dragged someone or been dragged to a sculpture called Cloudgate. If that name doesn't ring a bell, that's probably because everybody just calls it the bean. You know, it's the sculpture that looks like a giant shiny bean. It's smack dab in the middle of downtown Chicago, and just a couple hundred feet away is Jewelers Row, a stretch of Wabash Avenue that's packed with jewelry stores. Of course, that means it's long been on the radar, of guys like Frank Collada. In 1961, I just did a year, nine months in the correctional, not a jail. And I get out. Remember Frank? Well, by the time he was in his early 20s, Frank had made a name for himself as a thief in Chicago. And in 1961, he had his eyes set on the crown jewel of the city's diamond district. And the billing's called the Mueller billing. Once you got Once power, you got a lot of power, 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 you don't care about the money no more. For the Las Vegas Review Journal, in partnership with the Mob Museum, I'm Reed Redmond. He's one of you, you kill him. You're listening to Mobbed Up, a true story about money. You're not supposed to have a profile like that, especially in Vegas. Crime. You want to be very quiet so you can steal the money. He always said if you pull a gun on somebody, you finish it. Because if you don't, it's going to come back to haunt you. And I remember saying, what's going on here? And he's saying, they're trying to kill me. And I said, who's trying to kill you? And then he shut up. And the fight for control of Las Vegas. The FBI will continue to look to the future to use the latest and most sophisticated techniques to fight organized crime. The mob would have destroyed Las Vegas. It's only a question, not if, or when it would be destroyed. I was there every day with these fellas. I had no idea that there was a a mob. And he once told somebody, there's bodies out there in the desert, and there's more every day. But if there is one area where the word war is appropriate, it is in the fight against crime. When you grab them, you'll bring them to the desert. You're going to know where the hole has been dug. 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 Part three claim to fame. At the end of part two, Frank Collada had decided to stop going out on scores with his neighbor, Crazy Bob. But he continued pursuing a career as a criminal, and a handful of years later, in 1961, he was getting ready for one of the biggest jobs he would ever take part in. The Mauler's Building in Chicago is a 21-story high-rise that today houses something in the ballpark of 200 jewelry stores. Frank tells me he and a partner of his, Dickie Gorman, had been recruited to carry out the score. They'd gotten a tip that a jeweler from New York City would be coming to the building to sell loose diamonds. He goes through the whole building and sells diamonds to these jewelers. I never was there before, but then after, you know, I went and cased it out, of course, before you arrive. I noticed that every floor, there were jewelry stores. Wholesale, you could buy them wholesale and jewelry. But I also knew that they had a hell of a security system done. If somebody alerted that there was a robbery in progress, they had gates that would come down and block the stairwells. So basically, you'd be trapped on a floor. The elevators would shut down. So you had to be very careful. Nobody sounded an alarm. Frank and Dickey had a couple guys on the inside who were supposed to notify them when the diamonds were inside the building. They wanted to be close by when that happened. So when the time came, they parked a car in the suburbs and took the L, Chicago's public train system downtown, doing their best to pass for businessmen 
heading downtown for work. So we went down there with top coats, fedoras, young guys. They booked a room in a nearby hotel using a fake name, Mr. Sterling, and waited for the signal. After a couple hours, the hotel finally called up with a message. So we're laying, he's laying on one bed, I'm laying on the other. We're watching TV or some shit. Uh, phone rings. I figure, well, maybe hopefully the guy's there. So we pick up the phone. Your package has arrived, Mr. Sterling. The diamonds were in the Mahler's building. Put the phone on, uh, the briefcase with the guns on them. We had two briefcases with guns on them. Put the overcoats on with the fedoras. Walk out of the Palmer house. Check out. We checked out. You want to make sure you check out? Checked out real nice. Proceeded to walk. Went across the street. Jumped on the elevator. Got off at the third floor or fourth floor. I forgot. Went all the way up to maybe the sixth floor or seventh floor. Got out. Then walked up another flight to go. You know what I mean? We were covering our tracks. Finally, Frank and Dickie reached the store where the New York jeweler and the diamonds were supposed to be. So we go into the, the little waiting room, knock on the door. Someone came to open the door, and Dickie flashed a fake security card. The guy opens up the door. When he opens up the door, we rush in there. We got the guns out. There's a New York jeweler. I didn't know he's, that's what he was, a New York jeweler. He's sitting in the chair. He's like stunned. Frank says he would later find out that the two store owners were the ones who had provided the tip in the first place. Apparently, they were going to get a cut of the score and be able to claim the loss on their insurance. At that time, I didn't know that they were part of this robbery. All right? I didn't know that they were doing it for insurance purposes. So we throw it all of them on the ground, and uh, Dickie's tying them up. And I go in the room on the side to go to the safe. And the safe's open. There's no money in there. There's no jewelry. It's, what the fuck? Where? The store's safe was empty, of course, because the store owners were in on the job. Dickie had apparently figured that out, so he told Frank not to worry, that they'd talk later. Meanwhile, they'd gotten a hold of what they came for, the pouch of loose diamonds. So we got these guys tied up, and we got the money, the diamond pouch. It's about a foot, a foot long. And it's maybe three or four inches high. So we'd leave out, and he leaves. I said, go ahead, I'll wait up here till I'm sure you're out of the building. So he leaves, and I wait. And I know, I know how long it takes to get from up there down. Then I follow. Same procedure. Elevator, or two flights down, jump in an elevator. Back then, we still worried about cameras. They probably didn't have any, but I didn't care. We did the same procedure. The leaf. I walk across the street. He's already there. He's at the platform downstairs. We had it. It was planned perfect. Believe me. I meet him at the platform. Here comes the train. Boom. We jump on the train and we go back. And as we're going back, you can hear all the police cars on the freeway. They're all heading towards up there. And we're on the we're on the train going back already. So we get back and uh, we jump in the car and. Uh, I open up the pouch, or Dicky opens up the pouch, and he's going through it. They're in cellophane. Diamonds, loose diamonds are in cellophane packets. This fucking thing is loaded with them. The plates on the car he was driving had been issued to a John Sarno, which an acquaintance told police was an alias Joe Collada used to use. Frank had turned eight years old just a couple months prior to the crash. I stole was having a difficulty understanding that because I was probably 10 years old then when this was coming to me. But I still admired him because as a kid growing up with him, I knew he loved to drive and I knew he was an excellent driver, which I wanted to be because he always put me between his legs to steer the car as a kid when we used to drive. But Frank's memories of Joe Collada aren't all positive ones. And I did see the violent side of him one time when I was very young in the car with two guys. It was a confrontation on the road. We were just coming from the cemetery. He was visiting his parents and he had his sisters in the car. And some guy spit out the window and it landed on my father's car. 
and he curbed the guys. And uh, when he curbed them, the guy in the passenger side ran around and was opening up the door of my father. And my father kicked the door open down, and knocked the guy down, and started beating him up. Then the other guy come and he beat him up. And then the third guy come, so we took off. He took off, and I watched him driving then as a kid. And I knew the kind of temper he had and how good he drove. Frank Collada looked up to his dad. He idolized him, and from a young age, he followed in Joe Collada's footsteps. They would hang a sack on a pole. They'd stuff the newspapers in there. People wanted a newspaper, they'd throw a nickel in there, take a newspaper out. Everything was on your honor. The problem with the honor system is that some people define honor differently than others. So I'd seen that paper bag, and I started watching people throw money in there. So then one day I saw the hell with it, and I shimmied up the pole, stuck my hand in there. Then it got to be easy, and I started looking for all these poles with the bags on the way to school. And I'd steal maybe two, three dollars. That's a lot of money back then out of these paper sacks until one day uh, they were individually owned. You know, he'd work for a paper company or whatever, and this guy was getting tired of being robbed with no papers, so he waited. And I started going up the pole, then I seen the guy running towards me. So I slid down the pole and I took off. And that was the last time I, uh, I stole out the paper bags. When someone told Frank's mom what he was up to, she was furious to find out her son had been stealing. And she says, you need to do something else than steal. What's the matter with you? And uh, she says, uh, I got your shoebox. I said, what am I going to do with that? She says, you're going to shine shoes. She said, you shine shoes, you can make a nickel, a quarter. You can make good money. Reluctantly, Frank did what his mother asked. He started shining shoes up and down Grand Avenue in Chicago. He'd charge a nickel and his clients, according to him, mostly barflies, would usually throw him a quarter. Not bad money at the time for a 12, 13-year-old kid. So I was doing pretty damn good. Until one day I ran into a, another guy, another young guy like me. He was shorter. And he was shining shoes on the other side of the street. And he didn't like the idea that I was on his street, as he called it. And he uh, yelled at me, and I looked at him like, who the hell is this guy? The two kids started yelling back and forth. They called each other names and stepped out into the street, both ready for a fight. This other kid was pretty short, so when they got to the middle of the street, Frank was looking down at him. And he went to grab my collar, and I pushed him away. And he says, this is my territory. I'm the only one allowed on this street, not you. You can't even get permission. And I said, what's your name? And he says, Tony Splatcho. And I looked up at the sign. I knew what I was doing. I said, I don't see your fucking name on the sign. And he said... He started laughing. He says, I'm coming back tomorrow. If you're on the street, you and I are going to fight. Frank has never been one to shy away from a fight. He went back the next day and the day after that, every day for the next week. But this Tony Spilatro kid didn't show. I didn't see him. Finally, about a week later, there he is. And he's yelling, come here. Fuck you, I scumped to me. So we met in the middle of the street again. And he said to me, what's your father's first name? I don't know why he wanted. At that time, I didn't know what he, why he was asking me that. I said, what do you want to know for? He says, it's very important that you tell me. He says, because my father overheard me talking with my brothers about having a problem with a guy by the name of Frank Collada. And my father come in the room and he says, find out if that boy's father's name First name is Joseph. He says, if it is, yous are going to be friends. It was an unlikely start to a friendship that would span decades and eventually take both of them to Las Vegas. After the break, Frank finds out how his dad knew Tony's dad, and the two new friends wreak havoc on the streets of Chicago.
Before the break, a young Frank Collada crossed paths with another kid from his neighborhood, Tony Spilatro. It turned out that Tony's dad, Pasquale Spilatro, had been a friend of Frank's dad's. Patsy, as he went by, ran a restaurant. Patsy's. On the near west side of Chicago. Everybody used to go in the restaurant and have his famous meatball sandwiches. Joe Collada had once helped Patsy Spilatro defend the restaurant from a type of extortion known as the Black Hand. Here's how it worked, according to Mob Museum content development specialist Jeff Burbank. The Black Hand is not necessarily tied directly to the Mafia, although Mafia members were involved in the Black Hand. The Black Hand was basically a term for an extortion method from the Italians, the Italian immigrants. And they would send a letter to a prominent Italian, a few non-Italians, but the vast majority were wealthy Italians, a doctor, a lawyer, or that kind of thing, and say, well, if you know what's good for you and your family, you're going to pay me $5,000 or something like that. At some point, Black Hand extortionists had started to show up around Patsy's restaurant. And according to Frank, Patsy then turned to Frank's dad. My father said, what day they come here, Patsy? And he told him. So he says, listen, I'll be here that day. I'll be in the back. So he went in the back that day, him and his partner. And they waited for the guy to come in. And Patsy told him, yeah, I got to go in the back to get it. Because he always went in the back to get it, the money. So the guy followed him to the back. And he never went out the front door. Because they killed him in the back. Author Dennis Griffin. When the Black Hand guys were, were due to come in for their collection of their, their money, Joe's dad and a couple of his friends were waiting for them, and they ended up killing the Black Handers. According to Frank, that wasn't the end of it. His dad had had other run-ins with the Black Handers, and he wanted to get rid of these guys for good. The first two guys he got, they were in a barbershop. And him and his crew, a few guys, a couple guys, they knew the guy was going to be in the barbershop because they used to muscle the barbershop, these grease balls. And so they went in there and they killed the two guys that were in there. Frank says the leader of this Black Hand group went into hiding, but his dad was able to track him down to a motel where he was staying with his wife. So they go to the motel, they kick down the door. The guy's in bed with his wife. They don't kill the wife. They kill him in bed with his wife. And they leave. After finding out about their father's relationship, Frank Collada and Tony Spilatro became fast friends. When they were in their early teens, Frank and Tony ended up at the same school, the Montefiore School on Chicago's west side. It was a school for high-risk youth, and Frank tells me he ended up there because he didn't like school. It started getting rougher and rougher in school for me, you know. The full story, as Frank would go on to tell it, is a little more complicated than that. He says the principal at his old school slapped him for wearing his pants too low, and that they'd gotten into a physical altercation after that. Frank wanted revenge, so he got another student to help him come up with a plan. So we planned it. He had recess there. So I said, well, I wait in the hallway. All the kids would go to the playground, you know. So he comes <laughs> down the hall. We got a blanket. So we throw the blanket over him. And we tie him real quick with the blanket, but enough for his legs he could walk, but he don't know who threw the blanket over his head. And we bring him into the classroom. We open up the window. Now, this rope was a long rope. And we hung him out the window by his feet. And uh, we left him there. We tied him a long rope. He knew it done. He figured it out. So we got in trouble, of course. Then they sent me out to school. Like Frank, Tony also had a less than positive experience in the public school system, at least based on what his classmates and teachers would remember about him. The following quotes come from a series on Anthony Spilatro that ran in the Review Journal in the 1980s. It was written by Michael J. Goodman of the Los Angeles Times. A teacher at Steinmetz High School where Tony attended the ninth grade would remember, He pushed teachers around. 
but there was nothing underhanded about the kid. Little as he was, there was an admiration for him. When he walked down the corridor, kids would fall in line behind him. One of Tony's classmates would recall Tony seeming moody and depressed, once remarking, I don't care whether I live or die. Another of his high school classmates would remark, I knew his reputation. If I beat him up, he would get me after school. I saw him cleave a kid's head open with a metal T-square. I saw him hit a teacher in the head with a gym bag. Just like Frank, Tony Spilatro seemed to have a knack for finding trouble. Or as Frank would put it at a mom museum event in 2016, trouble had a way of finding Tony. So what was Tony like as a teenage tough guy? Because, I mean, that was his thing, especially then. Tony was very, for a little guy, he was very, very good with his hands. He wasn't as scared of anybody. Anyway, I've seen him take down guys twice as big as him. He was fast with his hands, and he'd aim right for the guys. And uh, I never really seen him look for trouble, but it seemed to come to him because of his height. So he had this little guy's uh, personality, and you know, I always had to defend himself. Here's Jeff Schumacher, vice president of exhibits and programs at the Mob Museum. He's not destined uh, to become a mobster. I mean, his brother is a dentist, okay? He didn't have to become a mobster, but Chicago in the 1950s and 60s, the the mob was very dominant in Italian-American neighborhoods and in certain parts of the city, and it was hard to avoid knowing somebody who was involved. And and I think Tony got a taste for this pretty early on, And, uh, you know, um, it appealed to him. By the time Frank and Tony end up attending the Montefiore School together, it's the 1950s. At the time, you could get just about anywhere in Chicago using the city's streetcar system. And at first, Frank got to his new school by hopping onto the back of streetcars and hitching a ride. But before long, streetcar operators started chasing after him, and he needed a new way to get to school. Frank had learned how to hotwire cars by practicing on his mom's car after she'd gone to bed. So instead of taking the streetcars to get to school, Frank decided to put his new skill set to use. So I said, shit. So I start stealing cars. The same way I told you, and I drive to school. Tony said, how do you get her? I told him I got a car around the corner. Well, whose car? I said, I stole it. Oh. So I drive, at the end of school, I drive him home to his father's restaurant on Grand and Agden. He used to work there as a kid. Frank and Tony ended up getting into a lot of fights at the Montefiore School. And Frank tells me they only lasted there for about six or eight months. With the help of one of Tony's older brothers, Frank says he and Tony kidnapped and assaulted one of the other students they were having problems with. The next day, I didn't go to school. Nor did Tony. I think we stood away for about three, four days. Then they come and got Tony. And they arrested him. As you know, I was hiding. And they, uh, then they got me. The courts ended up allowing Tony to be released to work at his father's restaurant. Frank, however, was placed in a reformatory school, where he would have to live on campus. He did make it back into the public school system eventually, but at the age of 16... Frank decided he was done with school for good. He also decided to get more serious about crime, graduating from schoolyard fights and car theft to burglary and armed robbery. It started when he crossed paths with one of his neighbors, a guy he refers to as Crazy Bob. I'm, I had a car at that age, my own car now. I couldn't afford it. If I got a flat, I didn't know what to do. I didn't have the money. So I'm washing it in the alley, the alleys, back of the house. And this guy comes walking down the alley, and he's wearing a fedora with the brim bent up. Real tall, skinny guy. I used to see him around the neighborhood. He says, how you doing? I said, I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm good. He says, this your car? He says, yeah. He says, he says you know, I could use you. I, you, know, you could use me. He says, yeah, what I do? I said, look what I got. And he showed me, a, could have been a, a bunch of singles for I, I know. Seemed like a lot of money. And I saw him, he says, come with me. He says, I show you, we stick up joints. I'll furnish the gun, the mask, the gloves. 
I said, what do you do? He said, stick up taverns and gas stations. It's sort of like a cowboy, I told him, you know, doing stuff like that. So I'm making good money. He says, then he says, eventually, he says, we could do banks. You want to come with me? You, got, you can't afford this car. So I said, let me think about it. A couple days later, Crazy Bob came down the alley again. He said, are you ready? And I said, yeah. So he said, we'll go tonight. I said, all right. So now I got the car. So I pick him up. And we're driving around. Back then they had taverns in the middle of the block, you know. Uh, if you lived there, you'd patronize this tavern. It was all over. Taverns are everywhere. We call them taverns. So Dark Street, there's a tavern. So I parked the car and gives me gloves and I got a gun and a hat and all that shit, a mask. And he's got the same. I could take my glasses off. I used to have very thick glasses. Frank didn't want to be wearing anything that could tie him back to the crime, so he decided to leave his glasses behind. Then the two masked robbers got out of the car. We go in there and he throws a shot. Boom! At the back of the bar. It's a stick up. Well, Christ, think you scare everybody that you don't have to announce it's a stick up. So uh, he runs to the bar and he, everybody out on the ground, on the floor. So everybody gets on the floor. And I'm standing back there and I'm looking and I see a hat, a fedora, and a top coat. And that's the only thing that's not getting on the floor. So I said, get down, you mother effer. I'm screaming, get down. But the bar patron in front of him wasn't listening. He was refusing to get down on the ground, apparently daring the 16-year-old Frank to pull the trigger. So he comes walking over to me. He says, what are you yelling at? Who are you yelling at? He whispers. I said, jerk off over there. I said, you don't want to get on the ground. He says, it's a coat rack. I was so friggin' embarrassed. I went over and I slapped the coat rack over. I told Bob when we were walking, if you ever tell anybody this story, I'll kill you. I was a kid telling him, I'll kill you. Don't embarrass me. This was Frank's first stick up. He threatened to shoot a coat rack. But as embarrassing as it might have been, they did get the money. And that was enough to convince Frank to keep going out on scores with Crazy Bob. But before long, even to a young, eager criminal like Frank, Hanging around with someone like Crazy Bob started to seem like a bad idea. Not because he was a criminal, but because he didn't seem like a particularly smart criminal. You know, them kind of stick-ups are very dangerous. And he was very free shooting the gun, you know. And I knew that eventually, hanging with this guy, he was going to kill somebody sooner or later. He had no appreciation for people's life. That's why we call him Crazy Bob. Frank was done with Crazy Bob. But the teenager wasn't done with crime. On part three of Mobbed Up, Frank turns crime into a career, and Tony gets his shot at becoming a made man in the Chicago outfit. That was Tony's claim to fame. That was a big deal, because the top guys in Chicago wanted these guys to. This has been part two of Mobbed Up, a production of the Las Vegas Review Journal in partnership with the Mob Museum. If you're enjoying the series so far, I don't want you to miss the next episode, so please subscribe to the series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. You can help others find out about us by leaving a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, sharing your thoughts on social media, or just telling a couple friends. Mobbed Up is reported and produced by me, Reed Redmond. If you have any tips, feedback, or questions you want to share with me, you can reach me on Twitter at Red Redmond or send an email to rredmond at reviewjournal.com. Our sound designer and audio editor for this series is Jonathan McMichael. Our theme song is composed by Jonathan McMichael. Thanks again to Frank Collada, whose memoir, Frank Collada, Hole in the Wall Gang, In My Own Words, served as a reference for this episode. Thanks also to Frank's biographer, true crime author Dennis Griffin, as well as Jeff Burbank and Jeff Schumacher from the Mom Museum for sharing their insights on this episode. Select clips used in the intro to this episode are from the Oral History Research Center in the UNLV Library Special Collections and Archives. 
Music and sound effects used in the episode are from Stephen Arnold Music and Motion Array. You can learn more about the Mob Museum by visiting themobmuseum.org. And you can learn more about Mobbed Up by visiting reviewjournal.com backslash podcasts. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you right back here next week. Bye.